Put your hand on your heart and just say, Lord, speak to me. Make it personal, Lord. Speak to me today. Change me today. We ask it for your glory, Jesus. Amen. Amen. You guys can be seated. Thank you, worship team. I, man, I just love, I love how we, we, we're, we're kind of being intentional about this, reading scripture together. I love the fact that we, our worship team is always saying scripture in that little middle section. Like, that is so cool. You know, that's kind of what, that's what the Psalms are. They were meant to be sung, and um, it's just super cool. All right. Y'all feeling good today? <clears throat> Someone told me I wasn't as funny when I, since I've been back from sabbatical. What does that even mean? What am I, Jim Gaffigan or something? You know, like, what do you want from me? Um, well, today, so you, you were expecting a joke. There isn't one, so maybe they're right, okay? Um, fall communities are here. If you're not in a fall community, you can go to thedwellingchurch.org, and you can sign up for one. It's not too late. Um, there's, there's a house near you somewhere, a coffee shop near you somewhere. You can get plugged in with people. That's really where church happens. This is really cool. I love this. But church really happens in homes and with small groups of people. Just, I would say the cliche, doing life. But that's what it is. Like, don't hate on it. Like, just let's live life together and grow and love Jesus more. Um, we, we have a special opportunity today as we have for almost every Sunday for like two months now, of sending out a family that is just precious to us. And uh, let me just explain why we do this. Somebody's like, what's the big deal? Why you got to call every family that leaves the church going somewhere up on the stage and all this? Because I want to reiterate visually what we're about. The moment we get greedy with people is the moment the Lord stops entrusting us with people. And so we live an open-handed uh, church community here. We're, 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 we're actually wanting to send people. And so two weeks ago, we prayed a couple out of here on their way to Africa as full-time missionaries. And this week, we're, um, we're praying over the meals. So Micah and Alexis and your family, y'all come on up here. Well, maybe not the family. They're in kids where they need to be, right? Okay. Come on up on the, <clears throat> on the stage. You want to? For every of these guys, um, without sharing too much, I just want to say I just got mad respect for these guys for how they're uprooting their lives and they're moving closer to family because um, their family needs them right now. And I, I, they should be applauded for that. And I know it's not like some hero thing that you guys are after. You're just being good kids to your parents. And I just, it's just really special. Um, and so there's nothing greater than then what we want to do is just bless you guys in that. Um, so I, I just want to ask our elders lead team, anybody that wants to come up, let's just pray over these guys. I will say this too. Alexis has been serving as our administrative assistant um, for several months now. Uh, it's like we hired her, and then I was like, bye, I'm going sabbatical. And I get back, and she's like, bye, I'm leaving too. So it's like, that was great, all right. <laughs> but uh, Alexis has, has been one of those game changers really cleaned up a lot of stuff and created some systems that we really needed. And I'm just so thankful for you guys. Matter of fact, when you first showed up, which is like Sunday one or two, like it was right there at the beginning when we were in the movie theater. Um, I think I was talking to Adam and Andrea and I said, these guys are game changers. Because when you plant a church, you got people come in like, let me check this out, you know. But they came to welcome home like immediately. Like, where can we serve? Where we? I was like, those are the kind of people we need right now because we're barely making it, you know. And so these guys have been truly uh, game changers, and their family has grown since they've been here. Got uh, two little beautiful baby boys, and um, we just love you guys so much, and we want to pray over you right now and just bless you guys. Okay, so if you want to, just stretch your hands. Let's just. Uh, Let's just together in our hearts, just bless them. We bless you in the name of Jesus. Lord, we bless. Um, we, just, we just know that they're already blessed, and your favor is already on them, and everywhere they're going to step, you already are. Lord, we just, God, we just pray just a special blessing for being biblical and taking care of their parents, Lord, and just 
We pray that everything they ever need, they'd have. Lord, we just pray that um, they'd be overwhelmed with the nearness of your presence during this season. And um, Lord, we just pray that over. And we, and we just say this together. We bless you in Jesus' name. We bless you in Jesus' name. Amen. We love you guys so much. Come on, give it up for them. We love y'all. All right. So, Mode, come on, come on, stay up here. Um, so, we'll just kind of do the one, two, okay? <laughs> so, Mode Davis, which you, you know her as Brandon's, <laughs> Pastor Brandon, kids pastors, um, help out with our, our leading our kids' teams and everything, but Mode's been here a while. Mode is taking over that role of administrative assistant. So, there's no gap, and I'm telling you, like, Alexis has been wonderful. She said, here's what I want to do. I, I know I'm leaving, but I want to make it really easy for whoever's coming in behind and just set it up, just a seamless thing, and I'm just so appreciative of that. But I'm really excited about Mo. Come on, let's give it up for Mo. Love you. Glad you're on the officially on the team. You've always been on the team, but all right. Okay. I'll get back. She said. Okay. Can we stand up one more time for another... Scripture, Renny, you can't say we don't love the word around here. I mean, all right. Amos 9, verses 11 and 12. says, In that day I will restore the fallen house of David. I will repair its damaged walls. From the ruins I will rebuild it and restore its former glory. And Israel will, will possess what is left of Edom and all the nations I have called to be mine. The Lord has spoken and he will do these things. Amen. You may be seated. We've been in a, pres uh, in a series about the presence of God called God is Here. We've been talking about how we are to live a life as a walking, talking temple of the Holy Spirit. What it means to be a place where God's glory rests that we carry with us wherever we go, whether we're on the job, in our homes, at school, we are to be that dwelling place. That's not even something that we're striving after. That's what we are inherently in Christ. He is in us. We're in him. But there is a reality of a life cultivated for that. You know what I'm saying? Like how, Just like the Bible says, be holy as I'm holy. Well, it, you are holy, but you also got to live it out, Right? And knowing you are a tabernacle or a temple of the Holy Spirit, live that out in our lives. So what does that look like? We've been talking through this stuff. And I will say today, if this is your first Sunday, if this is the uh, first Sunday you've been back in a while, um, go listen to the, the messages and all that stuff from this series. I think it'll give you a lot of context. I wish I could catch everybody up today, but I'm, I'm just taking a chance that the Lord is going to speak through what I'm saying today that builds on what's already been said, okay? So uh, today we're talking about um, something that is, it's become really near to my, dear to my heart. Uh, and and more, off, more than, a, than, a, than a sermon today, this is more of a talk as a house, as a family, as a church family. Um, I'm not going to be expounding a lot of scripture today. We read the scripture. We've been singing it. But I want to share with you just kind of a, a vision for church. Is that okay with y'all? What I mean, what in the, in the new covenant, in this New Testament model of Christianity, what is the church really supposed to look like? You know, and I think we, you know, we've got all kinds of expressions of community and faith and you know, we've got liturgical, even in our, just in our city, we've got all sorts of expressions on Sunday morning that look totally different, but we're after the same thing, and that's just encountering Jesus through his word and through his Holy Spirit. And I just, I believe, so what I'm saying is there's different expressions, but I, but I feel like the Lord in this hour maybe is kind of funneling us back down to what really matters 
in what the calling and the assignment on his church really is. And I want to talk through some of that today. Some of this is me processing out loud, to be honest with you, which can be a little dangerous. And so I need you to give me some grace. But here's what I need you to do as well. For the black and white thinkers in the room, I love you to death. Today, you're going to hate this, okay? Because... <laughs> It's going to be so nuanced, and I'm going to lean the plate this way, and you're going to be, yeah, but what about, yeah, I believe that too, okay? But I'm just trying to bring balance. I feel like one of the main things the Lord calls me to do, just in this church, I feel like, is to like, there's, think of it as a plate, and all the things the Lord has for us is on this plate, but sometimes the plate dips this way, and that's okay, and sometimes I'm supposed to dip the plate back the other way. And, um, and so that's what this morning is. So don't hear me saying I'm against anything. Okay? Yeah. All right. All right. I just want us to focus in a little on a certain expression of what the church needs to be. And I want to talk today about David's tabernacle as a model for the church. We talked about David's tabernacle just in review. It was a tent in Jerusalem where the Ark of the Covenant was set up. It kind of broke the mold for worship during its time under this old covenant. And it was this tent where the ark was there. David said, I want 24-7 singers and musicians. And I want us just to be all about the presence of God. When you walked into David's tabernacle, there was an awareness of the presence of God like nowhere else. That We've talked about this essential presence where God is everywhere, but there are spaces created there are cultivated spaces where his presence is manifest, right? So you could be down at the bar or you could be down at the river on a boat or whatever and God's presence is there, but there are moments where God's presence is felt and known in a way that's not like every other time. Do you understand what I'm saying? And I think that... I think. Scripture teaches us as well that there are spaces that we can cultivate where God is welcome and he comes where he's wanted. And number one, I just think that's what the church ought to be, that when we gather together, the word, yes, the word ought to be taught, preached. We ought to sing, but overarching everything. Yes, we ought to reach people, but overarching everything should be God is here. God is here. And so that phrase is more than just a series that we've been in in the fall. This is the, the mantra of this house. And I believe it should be of the entire church that we want God more than we want anything else. That we want his presence. Because if we don't have that, we've got a lot of talk. We've got a lot of ministry going on. But none of it matters unless he's in it. It's all about Jesus, and it's all about him being entwined with everything we do in a manifest way, right? Not just going and trucking along and saying, I hope you're blessing this, God. But no, Jesus, we want you here or nothing matters. We want you here. And he comes where he's wanted. And so this model of David's tent or David's tabernacle. It's two things we talked about, I think, two weeks ago before the storm. Y'all okay, by the way? That was rough. <laughs> um, I've just got, we were seeing about fire and wind coming, do it again. We don't want wind, God. We don't want that kind of wind. I was, that's all I could think about. That was scary. <laughs> about three o'clock in the morning, it got, I have, this is me, y'all. I'm just lost now. I don't know what I'm preaching about. So the, the, the tent, if we're to be an expression of that if, that, if that tapped into something on God's heart that David, a man after God's own heart, tapped into, then that's maybe something that we're called to, to, to at least represent, maybe not practically, but like it's who we are and it's what we're walking into, then it valued two things. Number one, the presence of God above all else. And the openness for the nations to come in and experience the presence of the Lord. And when I say nations, I mean people who are far from God. And that, I mean, we've got the lost or however you want to put language on that. But the church ought to be, therefore, a place 
where when we're gathered in any respect, whether it's in communities or whether it's on a, in a warehouse on a Sunday morning, that his presence is known. And when we walk into a place like this together and we worship, we invite him to come in a, in a tangible way that he comes and he speaks through his word and he transforms us. But it's also to be a place where people who have not experienced that yet can come in and experience it. Two weeks ago, I said that missions, at the very heart of what missions is, it's inviting people into the presence of this good father through what Jesus has done on the cross. It's just about inviting people into his presence. And through the cross, he's made a door for us to come. I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father, but through me. The point is coming to the Father. Do we preach the cross? Yes. Why was the cross even a thing? Dwelling. That we might dwell with him. That he might dwell with us. That's what he's always been about. That's what it was about in the garden. And that's what you read in Revelation when all this thing is wrapped up. It's about God dwelling with us. And so it's both and. Everybody say, it's both. It's both. It's making his presence a priority and loving people well. I think that if we love God well, there's this overflow thing that happens where we actually have enough love to love other people. And so I want to talk about this. Like, what does this look like for us? And, and this is, I, 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 this is what I've seen, okay? This is what I see. A couple decades ago in the Western church, the American church, some molds started be, to be broken, like, for example, someone, and I don't know who this started with, but somebody said, you know what? I don't feel like I can invite anybody to church with me because it's real weird at my church. You know, my aunt sits in the back and she does weird stuff in church and I can't invite my coworkers, you know? Or on the other side of things, like, my church is so boring <laughs> Like, why would anybody want to come? I don't even want to be there, you know? And so it was like, okay, let's, so let's change some things. And let's, let's make it a place where new people feel comfortable to be. And they feel loved. And they feel welcome. And um, there's nothing wrong with that. That's great. Agreed? Yeah. I think that if anybody feels ostracized in the church, like, that's just weird. That's a little off. So, yeah, we ought to be a place that's with open arms, that welcomes all, that like. But I think what, what happened is we, we started on that route, and it was like, all right, so what we need to do is we need to cut out this and this tradition. It's really not, it's really not important, so let's just let's strip that away. And, and what, if you're not a pastor in ministry, you, you may not have heard this phrase, but it's it was a movement in the Western church called the church growth movement. And the, and the goal was, it's like, if you want to grow your church, in other words, if you want more people to come to your church to meet Jesus and be transformed by the gospel, then here's some things you can do to make your church the kind of place that open doors for all people, right? Nothing wrong with that. That's great. We don't want to like put, X is at the door of like, you can't come in here and experience God because blah, 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 blah. No, we, wanna, we want the doors open. And so we, you know, we did a lot of things like we, we, we changed up the music and we, we changed up the chairs. I mean, we don't have pews in here. You know, we got chairs. We move them around. That was a great idea, in my opinion. Like, we got, we got coffee and donuts out there and we got like, we did a lot of things that like just help people be okay with coming in. And I love that. And I love the heart behind that. And I think it's a really, really good thing because growth is a good thing, right? I love the fact that we're just about packed out here on Sunday mornings. Even with all these people leaving, 
Like we're, we're a growing church and growth is good. Growth is a sign of health. But what happens in the, in the church growth movement is it, it, because churches were growing, that it's like, oh, well, we need a new building because this one's not big enough anymore. And so it's like, okay, let's build a bigger building, which means bigger budgets, which means bigger everything. And there's this, there's this point, and that's, I'm not talking, I'm not, I'm not downing anybody. Remember what I said? I'm not against anything, but I've taught with people who have built massive things for God and they turn around and they look and they say what what did we do and I think sometimes when growth at some point in that process reach which was which started well with reaching people let's get as many people in the door as we can at by all means necessary at some point growth becomes the priority, not people. Now, I think you can grow and prioritize people, okay? Y'all feel the tension? All right, be okay with it. Just, just hear me out. But the problem is, is I think in our effort to put people at a, in a good place and love people well, we've actually centered everything on people. And instead of being present-centered and people-focused, we've become people-centered, and then where's the presence? The first commandment is what? Love God with everything. Jesus said the second is like it. It's love God, but love people. And it's in that order. And, and and we, I don't think you can be centered on people, and even be focused on the presence because it will always override the most important thing when you do that, and that is that God is here. And so the the most important person in the room on a Sunday morning, as much as we love the person we work with, and we finally got them to come to church. They're not the most important person in the room. They're important to God. But Jesus is here. And Jesus is the most important person in the room. And and, and, and we ought to to structure what we do with that person in mind. But I want to be doing what Jesus wants, not what the person wants. Do you understand what I'm saying? Do you feel the nuance in what I'm saying? I'm not saying we, we, we throw the people in the trash, you know, to like just have our spiritual experience. What I am saying is if we put him first and we're seeking him first, we actually have something to invite people into. We're not inviting people into a church to experience a church. Because the church is made up of people, and all of y'all are jacked up, including this one right here. We're not going to save anybody. And so I'd rather, I'd rather just have a place where God is that I can invite my friend to and, he, and them experience God. There's something called pragmatism. And when you're a pac- pragmatist, you just do what works. How many pragmatists I got? It's like, if it works, that's what we're going to do, you know? That's not bad. But I think that's what happened in the church growth movement is we, we, all the churches went, oh, wow, look what's happening. They're blowing up. Fastest growing church in America, front, front of every Christian magazine, you know? And all the pastors and ministry leaders went, oh, let's do that. Nothing wrong with some of it. But I feel like our attention went, Jesus is everything. Oh, oh, wait. Oh, wait, wait. Church growth. Well, church growth is good because it it points people to Jesus. Like, yeah, that's what we're about. But But the lure of money and of fame and everything else is real strong. I don't care how spiritual you are. It's going to tempt. And I feel like 
a, a lot of, not every church, I'm not dogging mega church, all that stuff. There's a lot of great stuff going on. But I'm just saying the temptation is there to take our eyes off the one that matters and put it on the people that we're supposed to be loving, but we've got it out of order. Yeah. And I don't want to be a church that is welcoming to people, but not welcoming to God's presence. Oh. Yeah. And there are plenty like that. Yeah. I think there are plenty that say, Oh, we just want God here, but they don't welcome others. And that's not right either. And so there's a balance. Yeah. But it's got to be God first, people second. Yeah. It's got to be. There's a story in 1 Samuel 4. Eli, the high priest, he's got two sons that are acting up, and they're supposed to be in the priesthood, but they're not walking with the Lord. They're doing terrible things. And the Philistines come in, and they raid the holy place and the ark of the covenant is taken by the philistines this is prior to david um taking it into the temple into the tabernacle and eli hears the word that the ark has been stolen and eli falls off his chair backwards breaks his neck and dies and his daughter-in-law goes into labor and has a child and they said, what do you want to name this child? And she said, name it Ichabod, for the glory has departed. I don't want to be a church that has Ichabod written on the door. I, I, don't, I, I love growth. I hope that we get to five million people at the dwelling church. What a nightmare, right? I'm not against growth. I think it's attainable that we have 600 people within a couple of years. I think, I think growth, growth on that level, I think that's attainable. A lot of change would have to happen. A lot of our comforts would be shaken. And I would love that. Because that means we're reaching more people. And that means that we more people are being discipled and they're experiencing the presence of God. But here's the thing. I don't want that at all if we don't have the presence. Yeah. Come on. Part of it's selfish. Because I'm trying to pastor that in my own power. And I've tried that on a small level. And I know it doesn't work at any level. Yeah. It will kill me and anybody else that tries to do it. But here's what I also know. If we, if we build a church to 600, 6,000, and the presence of God doesn't rest here and dwell here, yeah. what are we building? Right. Yeah. Yeah. What are we building? Yeah. And I'm not, just, I'm not just talking. I mean this. Yeah. <laughs> I hope you all know that. Like, I mean this. I love this church. I love what God's called me to here. And I hope you love this church as well and, 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 and give and serve here. But this church ain't it. And I just want to remind you of that. We got the dwelling merch and all that, but this is not it. You realize that storm could have knocked this building down. You realize that our 501c3 could be pulled tomorrow. We no longer be an organization. Guess what? It's not about the dwelling church. It's about Jesus. Yeah. And it's about a church just saying, Jesus, we want you. Yeah. And that's all we want. Yeah. So, this is going to be the fastest. That was my introduction. This is going to be the <laughs> fastest message ever, okay? It's got to be. So, we can either be presence-centered, people-focused, which is good, or we can be people-centered, Here's the marks of a people-centered church. You ready? Preference over presence. You hear a lot of things like, I really don't like this. I don't like fill in the blank. This happens a lot around worship just because it's maybe the most physical, uh, vis visual or the most, um, you know, touches the heart the most sometimes. It's like, you know, I don't really like when our worship team does that. I don't really like that song. I don't really like, you know what? Worship's not about us. 
When people start telling me that kind of stuff, I think, oh, they just don't understand that it's not about them, you know? There's all kinds of expressions, okay? But Jesus is the main thing. And does his pre presence trump what our preferences are? Now, some of y'all are like, yeah, yeah, yeah. If, some, if we started changing some stuff, some of y'all get real upset real quick. And he'd be like, where's this coming from? Because we get so married to the way of doing things and thinking a certain way and everything. I'm telling you, his presence must be over our preferences. The mark of a people-centered church is performance over presence. Now, I hear, you know, you see people share stuff like this. People want to shake things up, put things on Facebook. And they'll say, you know, well, worship, this is all about performance. They're up there with guitars and, you know, I don't know. I'm just, I ain't even talking to y'all, you know. It's not, it's people out there, you know. And, um, but I'll tell you, I'm going to tell you once and for all how to tell the difference between performance and true worship. You ready? You can't tell the difference because worship is about the heart, it's not about the style. It's not about the jeans they're wearing. It's not about the fact that they got a drum on the stage or whatever. It's about the heart. Who are we worshiping? That's the main thing. So, uh, man, I got so many notes, and I just don't have time. Rachel doesn't have anywhere to be. Y'all good? I'm just kidding. Some of y'all hungry already. Um, I do have to say this. This is for Adam, I think, more than anybody else. All right. <laughs> Excellence does not equal performance. I think I've heard you say that. Yeah. It's not performance just because you're practicing right. to present a good offering to the Lord, not, from your, not only from your heart, but from the skill he's given you, you know? <laughs> like, so that's the whole thing. I've heard people just go off the rails. I don't believe worship teams should practice. Enjoy your church service. <laughs> I think I've been to some of those churches where the worship teams are practicing. I don't think that's performance. I think that's called good stewardship. Why would you bring God an offering you didn't put any effort into anyway? Okay. Number three. Systems and structure over spiritual power. One of the gifts to the body of Christ that the church movement, church growth movement brought was systems and structure. Because <laughs> you've been to your grandmama's church. There ain't no systems or structure, you know. <laughs> One of the things it brought that really helped things. It really helped people be pastored. It's like, oh, we know you're here. Because we got you in our system, you know. We got you. We got a, this is how you check in your kids. And like, oh, this was easy. Okay, wow, you know. That's great. We should have good structure. We should have good systems in any organization. There's nothing wrong with it. It's needed. But let me ask you something. Did you learn during the storm that you can have the best HVAC system money can buy, the best refrigerator, <laughs> the best this or that, and if it doesn't have any power, it's useless, right? It's just completely useless. We paid a goo gob of money to put a, a, a HVAC system in just a few years ago, and that thing wouldn't even turn on during that storm because it had no power going to it. And all I'm saying is, if you have system and structure, but you don't have the presence. You got people walking in a line. You got people's addresses. You got, you got leadership structure, and you got all this stuff, but you don't have any power. And there's something, I mean, I, I love all that stuff, but there's something when you go to like a, in the mountains of Central America where I've been before and there's like, there's just a little mud church and there's a guy that's probably not qualified to be a pastor, but he's all there is and God uses him and there's power there 
and you don't have anything else but a little mud brick building and people walking to church and flip-flops in the mountains to get there, but God's there. I love systems and structure, but I love God's presence more than that. And I think systems and structure are actually the grid work that God moves on sometimes. So here's, here's the thing. I, love, I would call Adam out a lot in this because I've heard him say this. If you don't have a structure, you won't know if God's moving. Some of these churches is just wild and crazy and there's no order at all. Like, it's like, how do you know if God's there and not, you know? But if you've had an order this morning, then you're like, oh, I'm actually sensing a departure from normal here. And I know that this is God. And that's happened countless times in this, in this room on Sunday mornings. And it should be happening in your communities. Like when you're sitting around tables or sitting around in, in, your, in the living rooms. It's just like you had a plan, group leaders. Has this ever happened to you? You had a plan and God interrupted that plan. And group just ended up totally different than you thought it would. That's a good thing. And it's a good thing that sometimes when our systems and structures get broken... Because God's here. Yeah. I'm okay with that. How about you? Yeah. All right. Another mark of a, a people-centered church is fear of man over freedom. The fear of man over freedom. Churches that are, are they've made people the center are more worried about offending people than pleasing God. And we've seen that. We've been in that. I can tell you that one of my great, I'm just being honest with you, uh, I have never, you know, I'm, I, I haven't fallen off the wagon morally or anything like that. I've been faithful to my wife. I, you know, try to walk in holiness. But one thing that has been much a struggle in my life is pleasing people. I'm talking like completely chained up to it. And, and little by little, the Lord has set me free through the years. And I feel like I've come a long way. I wouldn't be preaching this this morning if I didn't. But... We, we, care too, we care too much about what people think. And when, when your people focused and not presence focused, I mean, when your people centered and not presence centered, inevitably it will become about what is everybody's opinion about what church should be? What is everybody's opinion about this? And it's like everybody's got a different opinion. Everybody doesn't like the same music. Everybody doesn't like the same anything. It was the one thing I've learned 20-something years now of being in ministry. It's like, us humans are real fickle. Man, we'll die on this hill one week, and the next week, we don't want to walk on that hill. You know, like, we just change our stuff all the time. And all I'm saying is, why would we structure church around the fickleness of people? Why don't we structure church around the presence of God? So a presence-centered church is where the presence of God is the priority. It is the overriding value of everything that's done. It is the lens through which we see everything we do. Hearts that cry, we must have him. He is our one thing. And what I love about it is you can do ministry through that lens and in that context and it doesn't compete. I saw it yesterday at Food Pantry. I saw a bunch of people that hadn't had power for a week. A lot of people come in this building yesterday. And they not only got groceries, but I lost count of how many tears were shed and people praying with each other. And I would walk by some of that and it was just like, you know how like sometimes your body responds to God's presence? It was just like... Ooh, God's over there, you know, like God's all in this today. And it was like sweat and groceries and let's get them out. And it's just, you know, it's just, it's beautiful chaos. Yeah. Yeah. And God was there. Yeah. And it's like, we could do food pantry, like I'll come in and get a number, get your groceries, see ya, you know. But we invite the presence of the Lord in it. Yeah. That's better than groceries. I don't care how hungry you are. That's, that's important. I just want to shout out our, our outreach 
folks for that. The teams that do, they, y'all do that like every other week, twice a month. It's a big deal. The marks of a presence-centered church is authentic worship, authentic worship, not hyper-hypocrisy, but this vulnerability. Have y'all seen that up here on, from this team? Of like, I'm up here and I'm just being real. And there's something you can sense about it. It's not like this. Um, I never want to. I never want to. And I know this is Adam's heart. I, I never want to become a church where we're so polished up here. Don't hold your hands like that. Hold them like this. I don't know. Like y'all do what you want to. But I, I'm just thinking like. We just need God here. And let's just be who we are, worshiping God and knowing that he's here, believing that he's here, and responding to him. And I love that our worship team does that. Can I just say this? Though? Like, I know I sound like I'm bragging. Don't be like all those people around us. Be, we're awesome. That's not what I'm saying. I'm saying I feel like we're moving in the right direction. We got a long way to go on a lot of this. Like, I just, I'm just trying to tip the plate a little bit. Spirit-led gatherings are mark of a, mark of a present-centered church. This doesn't mean chaos and disorder. You know, it didn't. Nobody had to be dragged out from under the chairs. It wasn't God didn't show up. You know, like I remember going out to eat on a Sunday one time, and and uh, and they said, "How was your service this morning?" You know, you go to restaurants after church, and it gets pretty crazy. Which all the church people. And, uh, and I remember one guy, when I was a kid, and one guy said, well, we, I don't know if they ever pulled them down off the of chandeliers or not. You know, like, <laughs> some of us, like, if God didn't show up if somebody's not hung up in the lights, you know. <laughs> it doesn't mean chaos and disorder. It doesn't mean, listen, spontaneity doesn't negate a structure to things. Like I said a while ago, sometimes it's the, it's the guide rails of like, oh, God's here because we're, he's deviating from what we, we had planned. It's, the, it's like sales, you know? Sales are not meant to look pretty. I mean, they are, but they're functional. They're meant to catch the wind, right? That just, did y'all get, get that? Like, sales are meant to catch the wind. That's what structure is. And so they serve a purpose to move the ship. So we, 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 align, we just adjust and align to the, to the presence. And God, help us to do that. Like, help help me not to plow through what I think you want me to do without acknowledging that you're in the room and you're doing something. And I, Lord, we adjust to you. Can you just say that in your own personal life? I'm not just going to plow ahead after money or fame or like uh, blessing and all this. No, I'm just, I'm going to, I'm going to pause and make sure that you're with me. I always want to be with you. I always want you to be with us. That's my prayer. And then the, the, the final thing is a, a present-centered church just has a genuine love for people. And here's why. Because they've met God. And, and, and when you meet God, when you see Jesus for who he, who he is, one of the natural things that happens is you love other people. You know, I... As spiritual as, as some people are, if they don't have a love for other people, I doubt they really know him, you know? One of the, my favorite histories in the church is the Moravians, and they had this encounter with God in Hanerhut, Germany, and, and, and the Holy Spirit just moved among them. It turned into a prayer meeting that lasted for 100 years, 24-7. Out of that prayer meeting was born the modern missions movement. You know why? It wasn't like they... They encounter God and they say, you know what we should probably do is go sell everything and move to a foreign country to tell people about Jesus. No, it's because they got the heart of God in his presence. Yeah. And they were moved. Yeah. Yeah. They were moved. So I believe it's possible to be a both and kind of church. I think that is the New Testament model for, for church. I, I think church growth is good. If church growth is not the goal. Yeah. Yeah. I think success is good if it's not an idol. Yeah. Yeah. I think blessing is wonderful yeah. 
if it doesn't come what we're if it doesn't become what we're chasing after. Yeah. You with me? Yeah. All right. So let's all stand. And I don't have a I don't have a big dramatic ending today. I really don't ever. <laughs> Here's what I'll say. If you're in this place today and you're like, you don't know Jesus, this is probably a little strange. But God is here. And you don't need an altar call to give your heart and life to Jesus. And I just encourage you, just do it. Just surrender everything. He gave everything for you. Just give him your life. All right, so here's what, I, here's what I have written in my notes for myself, okay? And I'm going to ask you to do the same. If we're going to be that place of cultivated presence as a, as a church, we've got to lay down our ideals for the big picture. And that's what I've talked about today. We've got to lay down our ideals our preferences, and let God run this place. And that's, I'm, I'm saying that starting with me. Laying down my ideals, my expectations, and letting God run it. Laying down our ideals and let the church be the church. Not gripping so tightly to make this place what we think it ought to be, but just resting in God, being faithful to Him, being vulnerable, being honest, and just seeking to live holy and seek Him and just let this church become what it becomes. Can I say that to my leaders in the room? Let's let this place become what it becomes when Jesus arrests our hearts, okay? And it may look different, than we're used to. So here's the cost of not becoming present-centered. And I don't want to end on a sour note, but if we don't have His presence, we just become another shallow, Americanized version of the church that God will bless, but His presence won't mark it. And more than anything else, I want us to be a house where his presence is known. Not for our sake. Not so that people in Savannah say, well, have you heard about the dwelling church? God's there. That's not the point. I pray that when our hearts truly grasp this vision, that we will be a lampstand in this city of like, oh, you don't have to do church that way. You can actually go, let God have freedom. So, simplest prayer ever. Yes. Whatever God calls you to do, just say yes. In Jesus' name, amen. All right, love you guys. Have a great week. Youth is happening right after this.